The following sermon by John Willison was preached in the year 1733 on Joel 2:17. The sermon is called The Church's Danger and the Minister's Duty. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? At this time, 21 years ago, October 1712, I opened the Synod by a sermon on 1 Samuel 4:13, concerning Eli's heart trembling for the ark of God. Many of the members of the Synod are removed by death since that time, but those who survive may remember it was a very threatening time to that church. Yet it pleased our gracious God to save us from the storm, then impending, and allow her many halcyon days since, though, alas, badly improven. Wherefore the clouds seemed to gather again and looked very black. And a new storm from another quarter, if God doesn't prevent, is ready to blow. I have chosen, therefore, this text, which calls us for more than trembling hearts for the ark, even weeping eyes and praying lips also, and oh, that all these might meet us at this time. In Joel's time, the church and people of God were threatened with a desolating judgment, to prevent it, he calls them to public national fasting and humiliation, duties most proper for a people exposed to public national calamities. In the text, we have directions given to ministers for carrying on this work, in which let us observe first the persons addressed, the priests or ministers of God. Why? Because... They, who were the people's mouth to God, upon other occasions, were especially called at this time to stand in the open, to turn away God's wrath from the church. Though others are not exempted from his duty, it is a business of ministers, and in a special manner, Joel one thirteen, All night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, when others mourn in the day, it is your duty to mourn both night and day. Secondly, observe the place where they are to mourn and wrestle, between the porch and the altar, that is, the stately porch built by Solomon, and the great brazen altar, the public place where they use to attend the offering of sacrifices. There they are to pour out their tears and prayers in view of all the people. That by the minister's example, the people may be affected and wrought into the like pious disposition. Number three. Observe the words the ministers are directed to use and enlarge upon in their prayers to God. Spare your people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, and so on. In which there are several strong arguments used to prevail with God for the church. First. There to cry, Sparrow Lord, we confess our guilt and ill deservings. We acknowledge the justice of your proceedings, though we should be cut off. All our relief is in your sparing mercy, and this we humbly look up to and plead for with a merciful God. Secondly, another plea is taken from the relation they stood in to God. We are your people your heritage. We are the people that you have set your love upon, separated from thy church, taken into covenant with thee, ransomed from Egyptian bondage, delivered from many enemies and dangers, and preserved from ruin by a train of miraculous providences. Lord, spare the inheritances you have purchased for yourself at so dear a rate. Thirdly, they are to plead the reproach and contempt which would fall upon the church and people of God if God give them up. Give not up thine heritage to reproach. If you send a famine upon us, which was a judgment immediately threatened, 
than the fruitful land of Canaan. The glory of all lands shall be reproached as a poor, beggarly, and barren land, insufficient to afford sacrifices for the temple. Yea, we shall soon fall under the reproach of servitude to our heathen neighbors, who will make us an easy prey if once we be famished and deprive us both of our civil and spiritual liberties, and especially of God's ordinances, the symbols of his presence, and means of communion with him, which we value as our great honor and happiness above other nations. Lastly, there to plead in prayer that the reproach of the church will some way reflect upon her God and protect her. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? These barbarous people who watch for our halting will not consider our sins and ill deservings at God's hand, but will take reproachfully of God, saying, where is the God they trusted in? the God of whose power, mercy, and faithfulness they boasted so much of, they will say he is either weak and could not help them in their extremity, or unkind and would not. Lord, spare and pity the church for your name, your glory's sake. The master of our reproach is not so great, but Lord, what will you do for your great name? Doctrine in time of the church's danger, ministers are especially called to mourn, plead, and wrestle with God for her that she may not be abandoned or given up to reproach. In prosecuting the subject, I propose to show first when it may be said that the church has left or given up to reproach. Secondly, why ministers should be so earnest with God to prevent this calamity. Thirdly, make application suitable to the case of the church. The first head is to show when a church may be said to be left or given up to reproach and contempt. And here I shall mention several reproachful and church-exposing evils which ministers ought mournfully and fervently to deprecate, especially when a church is threatened with them. As first, when a church falls into a backsliding condition, religion in her is under a visible decay. Her members leave their first love, degenerate from their predecessors' piety and zeal, turn loose and indifferent about God's truths, their former declared principles and the solemn engagements they lie under to maintain them, and not only so, but turn careless also about the practice and duties of religion, such as family worship, secret prayer, Sabbath sanctification, and gospel holiness. When people lose their former spirituality and liveliness in God's service, and their duties dwindle away into a dead formality, when they content themselves with external ordinances and communions, without communion with God in them, when they turn carnal in their conversation, Christian love declines, malice, hatred, and envy increase, then it is that the church is left and given up to reproach. These are church-disgracing evils, which ministers should earnestly deprecate and cry, Spare! Secondly, when destructive schisms and divisions invade a church, so the good man, both ministers and professors of religion, entertain rough thoughts and break out into uncharitable reflections and severe censors one against another, and will not use lenity or forbearance to them who differ from them in some lesser things. These are evils we should earnestly pray against, seeing they manifestly tend to expose and ruin a church, for they put a stop to the progress of the gospel, version of souls and bringing of strangers to Christ. They hindered the sweet fellowship of Christians together and their mutual prayers with and for one another, 
and open a floodgate for innumerable other evils. As for example, they took us off from the vitals and essentials of religion, the life and power of godliness, and in the room thereof engage and employ us in many needless disputes, passionate strivings, envious whispers, unchristian backbitings and revengeful actions. How sadly verified do we find that word of the Apostle James in 2.16. Where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. We have reason to plead and cry against this woeful spirit of strife and contention. For where it does take place, the church's best friend is highly provoked. The Prince of Peace and she herself is sadly exposed to the scorn and derision of her enemies. Thirdly, it is most reproachful to a church when doctrinal errors creep into her, when her teachers begin to turn back from the pure truths of God handed down to them, invent doctrines which have a tendency to Arminianism, Arianism, or Deism, when they extol natural reason more than revelation, the power of corrupt nature more than efficacious free grace, men's own moral performances more than impurity righteousness, Jesus Christ as a pattern more than as a propitiation, or any other opinion which tends to sap the foundation of Christianity or reproach the Holy Spirit's operations and life of faith with the name of enthusiasm. These are church-exposing evils which we ought to bewail and pray against. Fourthly, it is reproachful to a church when she is smitten with barrenness and unfruitfulness with respect to converting of souls and bringing forth children to God, when the great doctrine of regeneration and the new birth is little preached or experienced in her, or when in judgment she has given her a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Lord, spare your people and give not thine heritage to this reproach. Fifthly, it is a church disgracing evil when God withdraws his Holy Spirit and its gracious influences from her ministers and teachers in any measure or degree of which there are many, and each of them is to be dreaded and deprecated by us. When we are deprived of the gifts and qualifications we once had, when the light and knowledge we retain has no influence on our consciences, when we lose our spirituality and liveliness in the worship and service of God, when we are straitened in our approaches to God, when we begin to think duty a weariness and our hearts are alienated from it, when heart plagues and indwelling corruptions prevail and increase, is heart atheism, unbelief, carnality, and so on, when we incline towards the temptations of sin and society of ungodly men, when wanted restraints are taken off, and when we turn loose and profane in our lives, so as like Eli's sons to tempt men to abhor the offerings of the Lord. O Lord, spare your people and give not your church to this reproach. Sixthly, it is reproachful to the Lord's vineyard when breaches are made in her walls and fences, so that our enemies of foxes and wild beasts break in and spoil the vines, when strangers devour her strength. Those of a different persuasion and communion spoil her of ancient rights and liberties. When patrons and their abettor thrust in pastors upon Christian congregations against their will, whereby God's ordinances are deserted, the ministry is contemned, the Lord's day is profaned, the flock of Christ is scattered and exposed as a prey to seducers. These are evils we should be well and pray against with tears, crying, Lord, spare your church, and give her not up to reproach. Seventhly, 
It is disgrace into a church when God hides his face from her, when under oppression and distress, and covers himself with a cloud that their prayers cannot pass through, so that enemies are ready to say, as in the text, where is their God? Where is the fruit of all your prayers? Where is he in whom you trusted for help? Where is your covenanted God of whose promises to relieve you in trouble you were wont to boast? This reproach is as a sword in his people's bones. Lord, spare your people and give not thine heritage to this sad reproach. Eighthly, it does sadly expose the church when her pillars are removed, when those are discouraged or taken away and were wont to weep and wrestle between the porch and the altar, and stood in the breach to keep off wrath from her. When her burning and shining lights are extinguished, the precious sons of Zion are thrown by as earthen pitchers. When faithful teachers are removed into corners or graves, and such put in their stead who are unexperienced in religion, Harden people in their sins, or lull them asleep in a Christless and unregenerate state. It is a distressing thing to a church when their pillars are struck at. Persecution is intended against the champions of Christ's cause, whereby others are intimidated with fear to own it. How low was the church brought in Herod's time, Acts 12, when James was killed with the sword? Peter in prison ready to be executed, and all the rest of the apostles were designed as a sacrifice. Then the pillar shook, the disciples trembled, and the enemies triumphed. This is a time of reproach, and it becomes all the ministers of the Lord to weep between the porch and the altar and cry, Spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to this reproach or any other church disgracing evil. Number two. The second head I proposed was to show why ministers should be so earnest with God to avert these church-exposing evils. The reasons for it. First, because God expressly requires us that their hand is in the text and also in Isaiah, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. Chapter 62, 6 and 7. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem, where we may see the great end for which God sets ministers in such public posts. It is not to keep silence in any evil time, as other prudent men may do, but to speak aloud in Zion's behalf and to intercede and wrestle with God for her. Number two, this has been the approved practice of the Lord's prophets and ministers in all ages. How earnest was Moses in wrestling and pleading for the church in his day. Exodus 27, 11, 12, and 13. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, with great power and a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out and slay them in the mountains, and consume them from the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest, and so on. Here is an intercessory prayer for Israel, full of the most powerful arguments, worthy of our imitation. In like manner was the prophet Samuel employed for the church in his time. 1 Samuel 12:23. As for me, he says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and cease to pray for you. So the prophet David wrestled for the church. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. Psalm fourteen seven, Psalm twenty five twenty two. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Psalm fifty one eighteen. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. 
So Asaph in Psalm 80, 14, Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and visit this vine, and so on. Likewise, the prophet Isaiah was thus concerned. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake will I not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. So the prophet Daniel wrestled fervently for the church, Daniel 9, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1, 5 to 7. And so did the apostle Paul, Romans 1, 9, Ephesians 1, 16 and 17. But I have a greater pattern to lay before you than all these, even that of the angel of the covenant, the great prophet and teacher of the church, Zechariah one twelve. How earnestly doth he plead for the church in distress, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these seventy years? Let us imitate him. Number three, because God is exceedingly delighted with such pleadings and allows great familiarity to those who intercede for his church and promises prosperity to them. Four, ministers should be more earnest for the church in trouble than other men because they are Christ's principal servants who should be more zealous for their glorious master than others. And no Lest the near relation the church stands into him, that she is his city, his house, his heritage, his spouse, his body, and a purchase of his blood. And therefore ministers, for their master's sake, should interpose with the greatest earnestness for the church. Number six, because ministers are by their office bound to have more compassion than others to precious souls which cannot miss to be in a miserable situation. When the church is distressed with spiritual judgments as a withdrawing of the spirit from ordinances and a plague of dry breasts. Number six, because at such a time the souls of ministers are like to suffer as well as others. For the church being the mother of us all, if it be ill with her, and her condition sickly and pining. Our souls must languish with other men's. Number seven, because ministers should best know the hazard of being silent and unconcerned about the church's danger and trouble, seeing there is a heavy woe denounced against them who are at ease in Zion and are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Amos six, one to six. And they know what wrath was threatened against Esther. If she did keep silence when the church was in danger, Esther 4.14. For if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Head 3. The Application First use may be of lamentation upon the account of our silence and unconcernedness, who are ministers about the church of God when in danger and distress. Ah, how few are there among us of Eli's disposition this day, whose hearts are trembling for the ark of God. How few weeping between the porch and the altar and crying, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine inheritance to reproach. Witness the unfrequency of fast days and the cold entertainment given to motions for observing them. What? Is it a time for silence and easiness when the affairs of Zion are in such a melancholy situation both at home and abroad? Is it time for us to dwell at ease in our sealed houses when the Lord's house has threatened to be laid waste by our woeful backslidings and destructive divisions? Is it becoming the character of Christ's ambassadors to show an indifferency anent his church's danger and to act a part of a heathen galio to care for nothing of these things? 
O, what cause have we to bewail the case of those who can be easy about the public interest of the church, if it go well with their own private affairs, who care not if they can swim in prosperity, though the church be drowned in tears and blood? What is this but to be like the king and Haman, who sat down to drink when the city Shushan was perplexed, Esther 3.15. For a Christian minister to mind his private concerns and neglect the public is as great a folly as if a sailor in a storm should notice only his private chest and neglect the vessel in which he and his effects are embarked. It is recorded as a praiseworthy action and a noble evidence of a public spirit in one Terentius, a captain under the emperor Valens, who having done some special service to the emperor, for which he judged him worthy of an imminent reward, he bid him ask what he would have, and it should be granted. Whereupon, after an advisement, he wrote a petition to the emperor that the orthodox Christians might have liberty of a church by themselves, where they might worship God separately from the Arians. The emperor, being an Arian himself, was much offended with the petition, tore it in pieces and threw it away, bidding the captain ask something for himself. But he carefully gathering up the pieces of his torn petition said, if he could not be heard in Christ's cause, he would ask nothing for himself. Alas, that we who are Christ's ministers should fall so much short of this soldier in concern for Christ's interest. But the best application we can make of this doctrine is for amendment. And therefore, I proceed to a second use of exhortation. And here, my brethren, allow me to be your humble remembrancer and my own monitor. And the duty exhorted to is that I have been insisted upon from the text, weep and pray for all the churches of God that are in distress, and especially the Church of Scotland, our mother church, which at this day is in danger of being torn in pieces and destroyed. If God in his mercy do not prevent it, let us cry with all our might, Lord, spare thy people and give not thine heritage in Scotland to reproach. Wherefore shall they say among the people, Where is your God? And for your encouragement to wrestle and plead with God in our behalf, let me offer these considerations. Number one, such pleadings are most acceptable to God and prevalent with him. Who are they but the wrestlers that deliver the church and preserve the land? Number two, those who are most concerned for the church in danger shall have the greatest share in her comforts when God rescues her. They who sow most of the seed of tears for Zion shall reap most of her joys when the harvest comes. Number three, we have noble arguments to make use of in pleading with God for this poor church, as well as they had of old for Israel. As first, the compassion of his nature, which is often interposed for this church when he seemed to have given her up. So was it in the case of Israel, Judges 10.14, where God appeared to reject them and bid them, go cry to the gods they had chosen, and let these deliver them in the time of their trouble. Yet when Israel persisted in crying for pity, it is said in verse 16, his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel, and he delivered them. Number two, we may plead the glory of his name as of old. John fourteen twenty one, Lord, do not disgrace the throne of your glory, namely the temple where your glory is displayed. Lord, we deserve to have disgrace put upon us, but let oh, it be in such a way that the disgrace may not reflect upon yourself, upon your worship, your ordinances, your attributes, your promises. Let not our enemies have occasion to reproach your name or to say, Where now is their God? Where is the God they always boasted of as superior to all the gods of the nations? 
so may we say, Lord, do for your own name's sake. It is no great matter what become of the ministers or professors of Scotland, but what will you do for your great name that may come some way to suffer with them? Lord, what will the Egyptians say? Exodus 32, number 3. We may plead his covenant with us as they did, Jeremiah fourteen twenty one. Lord, remember and break not covenant with us. Though we have broke to thee, Lord, do not thou break to us. We are a people in covenant with thee more explicitly than other nations. We are a land peculiarly given to Christ by the Father's donation, as being amongst the ends and uttermost parts of the earth and among the isles which have seen his salvation and waited for his law. We are a land most solemnly devoted to God by our reforming ancestors, who in a national way have vouched the Lord to be their God, and at the same time gave up themselves and their posterity to the Lord. And thou, Lord, didst declare thyself well pleased with the bargain. Thou didst fill the temple with thy glory." Work great deliverance for us. Raise up saviors to us when we were brought very low. Oh, do not now forsake thine inheritance. 